get started. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Leah Kerwin and I am a special assistant here at the Library of Congress for the Chief Financial Officer. But today I'm here in my role with the Hispanic Cultural Society and I'm a historian for the society and I've helped to put on this program to get today with Shelley Sandoval. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I think we're going to have a very exciting program for you today featuring sustainability and human security in, uh, in the Americas. Um, uh, just a little plug about the Hispanic Cultural Society. We're an employee-led organization that aims to uh, promote and preserve all, all Sorry, excuse me. All aspects of Hispanic culture among our employees and the community at large. So um, I'd now like to introduce Shelly Sandoval, who's going to be our moderator today and introduce our guest speakers. Shelly volunteers as a Spanish language docent here at the library, and she has an active interest in studies and teaching around geography and Latin American history. And she's a very enthusiastic member of our Hispanic Cultural Society and has done a lot of legwork here to help put on this program today. Let me welcome Shelley. Thank you, Leah, and welcome everyone to the Library of Congress, our Earth Day event celebration. Um, I would just like to give you a little um, background on this event. It was an idea I brought up to Leah um, as part of the Hispanic Cultural Society, and we put on the first Earth Day event last April in 2018, and um, we loved it, and we thought we would definitely do it again. So I'm so happy that the Hispanic Cultural Society was able to sponsor this event today. And um, also, I would like to say bienvenidos a todos. Um, también doy soy guía en la Biblioteca del Congreso. Si ustedes gustan, pueden tomar los tours en español también conmigo, con otras personas aquí en la biblioteca. Por favor, uh, vean um, el website de loc.gov, loc, uh, Library of Congress .gov. So you're all welcome to the Spanish language tours, but we also give English language tours every day. Um, the Spanish language tours can also be um, on request as well. And I'm happy to say that I'm also an adjunct at the University of the District of Columbia, and I also am academic support in institutional research at the Department of Defense. And so all of my comments are my own and don't reflect um, the Department of Defense or the government. And um, I really welcome all our guest panelists. Um, I would like to introduce them now. First, we have Dr. Rubens Chagas from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's an ecosystem ecology PhD and professor. And Dr. Chagas began his career as a for forest engineer in Brazil by the Forest Institute of Sao Paulo and later by ALCOA Alumnio. Um, and Dr. Chagas participated as a consultant in foresty, forestry projects in Brazil, such as the Hirao hydroelectric plant in Rondonia and the Serra da Massa power transmission line in Joais. Um, and he will be talking more about his work um, currently in Brazil. Dr. Chagas is also a member of the Society of Ecological Restoration. Dr. Raquel da Cruz is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Oncology at Georgetown University Medical Center. Dr. Santa da Cruz has a strong commitment to cancer prevention research and to improve the life quality of patients. Dr. Da Cruz received her PhD from the University of Sao Paulo researching maternal programming of breast cancer. And her latest research um, has been accepted for publication in the peer-reviewed Endocrine-Related Cancer Journal. 
Next we have Ad Godinez. Ad Godinez is a colonel in the U.S. Army, visiting fellow at the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University. Ad Godinez brings a broad interdisciplinary approach that impacts policies and strategies with a unique blend of military and international experiences shaped by the Army profession with nearly three decades of experience. And Ad um, has a positive attitude, intellectual cu curiosity, interpersonal and research skills, appreciation of experience, and the desire for other perspectives to build credibility and mutual respect to create a positive environment that yields results for collaboration and trust. So welcome. Um, after ad, we will have Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson is the professor of practice at the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, National Defense University. Mr. Patterson is a 1989 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and retired um, as, um, as a commander in the Navy in 2009. His last assignment was the political military advisor on the 4th Fleet Staff in Mayport, Florida. And he has published in numerous journals, um, journals on defense and security, including Military Review, Armed Forces Journal, Proceedings Magazine, Joint Force Quarterly, and many others. Finally, we will have Patricia Klo. Patricia Klo is the Deputy Editor and Associate Fellow at PRISM, the Journal of Complex Operations. Ms. Patricia Klo is an Associate Research Fellow in the Institute for National Strategic Studies. And um, finally, I would like to say that um, all questions in, um, are welcome after the pre presentation of all five of our guest speakers. And um, also um, to, to just be mindful of time, if you would like to submit questions also in writing, you are welcome to do so as well. So to get us started, I would like to welcome our first um, speaker, Dr. Rubens Chagas. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I would, I would like to thank the Library of Congress, Hispanic Cultural Society, Lia Karen, Professor Sandoval, uh, the other speakers, and the audience for the opportunity to talk about sustainability and the human security in the Americas. It is a complex subject but it will introduce some reflections so that we can continue debating in future events, maybe. So, apologize for my English first. But if you don't understand something, um, please send me an email that I will respond uh, quickly, okay? Um, the content of this presentation represents uh, just my own opinion, okay? First thing, Brazilian environmental secure. Uh, we have the one question for a start. What is importance of Brazilian ecosystem to the world? For example, the Amazonian ecosystem is the largest and the most important tropical forest ecosystem in the world. Represents one third of the world conserv conserved tropical forests. 67% of which in Brazil territory. Among the 
522 different indigenous groups living in Latin America. Approximately 100 isolated indigenous groups living in the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. The Brazilian Amazon rainforest has mineral reserves that can exceed $20 trillion. But we have one question. What is the current social environmental situation of Brazilian federal environmental management? Um, well, on the other hand, uh, everyone know the long history of degradation of the Amazon forest. And perhaps Brazilian forest ecosystem, such as the Cerrado, is similar for Savannah, African, Africa Savannah, are under serious threats of their integrity and the safety. And uh, we have illegal logging, illegal mining, large negative impacts, intensive farming, and the impunity for environmental crimes. For example, recently we have one corporate environmental crimes associates uh, one and big company and two cities, Mariana and Brumadinho. In two cities, we have the Q people and they have the big damage, big impact for the romp of the dam. Okay. Um, therefore, I would like to share two histories uh, of my professional experience in the environmental area. They illustrate the current and the continuing situation of interference with the environment in Brazil and the socioeconomic implications. The first example is the recognition of the right to land by indigenous people, key elements for the conservation of Brazilian ecosystems. Um, in 2007, I participated uh, in a project for the ecological restoration of uh, social and environmental impacts in two indigenous territories in south of Brazil. Caused by one of the largest pulp mills in Latin America. In first time, this company refused to reduce the socioeconomic impacts caused by the operation, operation of the factory in the inside in the indigenous territories. In the okay. The second example, the second one, uh, yes, uh, is about the influence of unsust unsustainable Amazon mega projects. In 2009, uh, participated the team responsible for planning the flooded area of the Giral hydroelectric power plant. This work was located in the state of Rondonia, in the north of Brazil. Um, those responsible for the mega project reported a floodable uh, area that was much smaller than the flood area that was calculated by my team. The largest flood area include neighboring countries and there were more complex social environmental problems than expected. In Porto Velho, capital of Rondonia, about 20,000 people were left homeless after heavy rains in 2004, 2014 that surpassed the historical average of the region. And well, the relationship of these examples is inevitable 
linked to environmental safety issues. Brazil is the world champion of killing of the environmentalists in, 20, in, to, in 2016. Looking for the, the, the chat. And persons like Nilce Souza, uh, who was against the construction of the Giral Hydroelectric plant, is murdered. And for two consecutive years, Brazil ranked the first in the global witness ranking, which measures violence against environmental defenders with five to seven deaths. Um, the case of the Dorothy May Stang, or Sister Dorothy, is more famous because uh, it's murder in the Anapu, Pará, Brazil. And uh, the assassin was arrested, but released and arrested in the last week, 19 years ago, 19 years ago of the murder. It's incredible. Oh, and the current scenario in Brazil is not better than 20 years ago. Uh, approximately, approximately 1 million people were involved in rural conflicts in Brazil in, in the last year. 1 million people. And it's a significant increase of the 36%-ish, 36% in one year. Uh, is the, this question is very complicated, but um, this week, Mark uh, Douro Jamin, uh, this name is Mark Douro Gemini, described to the Brazilian newspaper for, the name is the, the Echo, or O Echo in Portuguese, this week, something that is well suited for this moment. He said, it seems that nothing is effective against an establishment that simple decide not to read, not to listen, and not to see is accompanied by the blind inertia of much of society. In fact, the environmental term does not touch the Latin American masses. But for don't finish for the bad notes, <laughs> um, I will leave as final positive messages about of the social environmental restoration methodologies, methodologies that I believe so much to be one most functional. The name is Community Supporting Agriculture, CSA. And it's important because it change the concept of the culture of price, of a culture of appreciation. Muito obrigado a todos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chagas. And now we will invite um, Dr. Raquel Da Santos to please present. So the first thing I would like to say many thanks to the invitation to speak today here to sustainability and also human security in the America. So my name is Raquel and uh, I will talk about today uh, food insecurity and malnutrition prevalence in Brazil. So I would like to start my presentation to share with you 
colleagues like the pictures from my city, São Paulo, and they're also from my university, University of São Paulo in Brazil. So the first thing is uh, food security, hunger, and also malnutrition affecting, I think, millions of our children and also adults in Brazil. The malnutrition is defined like the not only un, uh, undernutrition, but also overweight and also obesity, and they also, and they also diet related no communicable disease, such as breast cancer. So in 1970, uh, in Brazil, have around 50% of the children in the northeast of Brazil that were stunted. But in 2014, these situations decreased, so changed, because the hunger in Brazil dropped in around 85%. So, and how is it possible? Why, why is this decrease? Because we have like increased the maternal education, we have increased the appreciation power of the families and they also improve of sanitations in there. And they also, we have improved improvements in the development of the food productions uh, by family and they also urban farms. And they also increase the number of the offer uh, to the low income population, healthy and the high quality meals at low cost. So also we have like increased the number of the implementation of the organic school gardens and the everything this contribute contribute to decrease the hunger in Brazil. So, but in the other hand, as obesity in Brazil is growing a uh, health concern now. And the, in the high incidence of Brazil, it's fine like in the lo uh, lower education levels and they also this is association is diabetes and they also hypertense incidence. And in addiction, uh, new, uh, estimate the number of the new case of breast cancer also increase, especially in young human. And uh, what what's happened? What's what something's wrong behind this? Is a typical thing or social or environment issues that are committed this young human? Uh, some scientists, some papers, some publications says that this happened because you have improvements in the early detections and also in the treatment for this kind of disease. But more and more evidence, um, evidence suggests that your lifestyle and also your experience can affect, uh, can affect your kids and also your grandkids such as your, the maternal nutrition, the uh, psychological environment, the social isolation, the pesticide exposed, everything can impact the fetal growth during the pregnancy period, and this can uh, change the risk of the offspring develop uh, chronic disease. So here I wanna share some proof that I already show how maternal, maternal diet can affect the offspring uh, incidence uh, memory tumors. So in the other hand, uh, my question is, what about the micro, micronutrient supplementation? It's good, it's safe. What's the dose it's right for you, for me? So we don't have idea about that. So during my PGG in Brazil, uh, because it's very common, like when you have younger humans that get pregnant, the doctor just uh, give the prescription, ah, oh, maybe you can start take some micronutrient supplementation like iron or zinc supplementation or selenium, but you don't know about the results. And that's the reason we, dis we decide to uh, evaluate this. And you check uh, maternal zinc supplementation during the pregnancy, if this can affect the female offspring, uh, susceptibility breast cancer in adult life. And we found that the maternal zinc supplementation increased um, breast cancer uh, numbers, tumor, tumors incidence in the female offspring. So my conclusion about this work is that, so you need to be careful when you think at, uh, start to think about take some extra medication because if you don't have like 
deficient about the micronutrients or vitamins, you don't need to think about extra medication because sometimes you can put your body to overworking. So, but it's not only mothers uh, need to think about the take care about themselves. The same things can be true for fathers also because his diet, his stress, uh, chemical exposure, everything also can influence and change some molecules that can change gene functions and this can contribute to high risk develop breast cancer or chronic disease in adult life. So here we have some papers that come from our group that already show that paternal obesity induced diet, also selenium deficiency, and they also low protein diet before conception increase the memory, memory, uh, memory tumor incidence in the female offspring. So my concern is, yes, what's happened in the womb lasts lifetime. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dos Santos, for that wonderful research as well. And now I'd like to welcome Colonel Ad Godinez. Shelley, thank you. Leah, thank you. Um, so I'm presenting my research today, um, and it's uh, it's been a long time coming. It's uh, all uh, research is my own. Um, my opinions are my own, uh, and I'd like to thank the Army for the opportunity to uh, do this kind of research. My name is Ad Godinez, and today I'm honored to be able to speak about our current opioid epidemic through a historical lens. In my study, I learned that the opioid epidemic is very similar to our first opioid epidemic. I hope that surprises you, and yet I don't think it will. I hope that surprises you, not, yet I don't think you'll be shocked when I mention opium dens, laudanum, and in 1898, the original Bayer Pharmaceutical released a heroic drug and named it heroin. Heroin was heavily marketed for its non-addictive qualities and a relative panacea for all maladies. The early 1900s were a very hard time to live. The market extremely chaotic, with very few states regulating any market, any market product including the pharmaceutical industry. And by 1906, the nation passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. It was as much about meat packing plants in Chicago as having people know what, they were, what was in the products that they were taking. In many ways, the current opioid epidemic mirrors the first opioid epidemic. Estimates from the 1900s are questionable, but a conservative estimate was a quarter of a million people were addicted, or about 1% of the American population. The large used population in the 1900s included more females than males, more whites than blacks, was not confined to any particular geographic region or to the cities, and was predominantly middle class. The pharmaceutical and healthcare markets were minimally reg regulated, and so society went to doctors to feel better. A good example can be found in today's parlance in the federal prosecution of 60 doctors, pharmacists, medical professionals, and other connected with alleged opioid pushing and healthcare fraud on April 17, 2019. These healthcare professionals provided 350,000 prescriptions for more than 32 million pills, a dose of opioids for every man, woman, and child across Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and West Virginia. Although history suggests that this is not a justice issue, it is far more complicated social political issue. In one way, in another way, today's opioid epidemic is different from the one in history. The admixture of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs has made the illicit market as chaotic today as it was in the 1900s. If you buy something on the street today, you don't know what you're taking. It can be, you could buy meth, and in fact buy meth mixed with fentanyl. Fentanyl or fentanyl analogs are a synthetic opioid relatively easy to create in small in large batches, creating an opioid often uh, described as 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. In a very new way, the current epidemic has changed because it is killing more Americans across the continent than ever before. 
The early 20th century addiction was a result of ignorance and willful invisibility. It grew from lax medical regulations and initial prescription and refills, over medication by doctors, and hidden ingredients in formal and informal substances. The broad availability of opioids in the 1900s, like the 2000s, led to diversion and misuse. Today, our society believes that we have the right to feel good, and we are constantly made aware that it is okay to self-medicate. After work, let's get together and have a glass of wine to relax. The Centers for the Disease Control and Prevention Week Morbidity and Mortality Report for January 4th, 2019 reported 47,600 of 70,237 drug overdoses involved, opi involved opioids for 2017. 702,568 702, overdose deaths were connected between 1999 and 2017. 56.2% of that was from opioids, and that's just the United States. In Canada, more than 3,900 overdoses last year alone. In Mexico, there were over th the opioid epidemic in Mexico manifests itself in violence. Over 30,000 Mexicans were killed that we know of uh, over the violence of controlling heroin and opioids. By taking a longer-term view of the past epidemics, I've identified how politicized the opioid environment became. The topic was a vigorous public debate in the United States. And at the same time, we talked about Mexico in the same language that is used in the political world today. I hope I've just showed you that the current opioid epidemic in the United States is not related to the heroin grown in Mexico. It is related directly to the doctors and the prescriptions and the uh, pain is a fifth element. Historians recognize three drug epidemics in US history. The current epidemic marks the fourth. The first came just after the Civil War from 1885 to 1925. S soldiers received morphine for the wounds that they had and became the soldier's ailment. The second epidemic was from 1950 to 1975. I've pushed that to uh, 75 because of the counterculture years. And again, there was this free um, movement between Mexico and the United States and heroin began to, uh, again to grow, poppy began to grow again in Mexico. Marijuana was an enormous problem until Operation Intercept, um, which led to uh, poor relations between the United States and Mexico for, for a long period of time. The third epidemic was from 1980 to 1995. This was our own internally driven epidemic um, with a little gaslighting from um, drug, drug traffickers taking cocaine, moving it into Mexico, and then Again, violence manifested again in Mexico. The ongoing epidemic, whose roots I argue can be traced to Purdue Pharma's release of OxyContin in 1996, was cemented when the American Pain Society put, pursued pain as a fifth vital sign. There are several myths surrounding our current epidemic to include the myth that these substances are coming from Mexico. The truth is that criminal systems that operate throughout our nation took advantage of the, of the cresting opioid crisis in 2007 and rapidly increased production of heroin. But that heroin is not killing Americans. It is a medical grade fentanyl and fentanyl analogs being produced in medical grade facilities sent around the world via our Amazon uh, supported network at minimal cost, often guaranteed by online marketers. So what is to be done? Frankly, we need to take the time to develop a shared understanding across the Americas and around the globe of exactly what the problem is and what we are as Americans. Are we resilient or do we fear pain so much that we'll do anything to not feel it? Do we really think that smoking a substance is the best way to self-medicate or way out of pain? The history suggests that American opioid epidemics last about a 30-year cycle, but with the po population generally unengaged in this current opioid epidemic, I think the opioid, this epidemic may last 40 years or more. Said another way, in the next 12 years, we will lose another 400,000 Americans to opioid overdoses in the United States. At least 100,000 Mexicans. If we extend that by 22 years, we can expect 1 million opioid overdose deaths. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Godinez, for that wonderful uh, synopsis on the opioid crisis. 
Next up, I would like to invite um, Professor Pat Patterson for his presentation. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the invitation from the uh, Hispanic Cultural Society to speak uh, on these issues. Uh, at the Perry Center at National Defense University, we study security and defense matters uh, in the region and throughout all the Caribbean and Latin America, and including Central and South America. Um, all the opinions that I'm going to uh, share with you today are my own. They're not uh, of the Perry Center, nor the Department of Defense, nor of the um, U.S. government. And I'd also, also like to recognize Cecilia Hartgee, who's here with us. She's our, my research assistant. We're working very closely on uh, some of the security and defense matters, and specifically on climate change as a catalyst for conflict, as they call it at the Pentagon. I think it's clear to everybody who's been following the issue very closely, it's a major concern, uh, not just in Latin America and the United States, but also throughout the globe. And some of the recent surveys from the Pew Research Center and a number of others indicated it's one of the top concerns, one of the top preoccupations about uh, for security and defense matters. Uh, even up there, as according to some uh, world uh, opinion polls, as a, much of a concern as terrorism and the Islamic State and other issues. But specifically in Latin America, and what's not widely recognized is that uh, climate change is uh, the top concern. That, and that's a bit surprising considering the number of other important issues and problems that exist in the region, such as corruption and uh, organized crime and violence and weak state institutions and so on. So putting that in perspective, Climate change is a major concern uh, of Latin Americans and Caribbean citizens. Another representative, or another representation of that is what the World Economic Forum puts out each year, and this is their Global Risks Report. This may be a little hard to read uh, there in the corner, but effectively what uh, the, the graph here de uh, demonstrates is the likelihood along the x-axis, the likelihood of an event occurring going from very low uh, risk of it occurring all the way up to a very uh, frequent or possible uh, uh, occurrence of it. And then on the y-axis is the impact from very low impact to very severe uh, consequences for the event. The, all the diamonds that you see on the screen, and I've provided the link there for you so you can read in additional detail, but all the diamonds are color-coded to represent whether it's a political issue or an environmental issue or an economic issue or a social issue and so on. The letters in uh, diamonds in green there at the top, which are on the, the bad quadrant, the most likely to occur uh, with the most impact, represent some of the climate change effects that are occurring, such as the most dangerous and with the highest impact would be extreme weather events. Now we're not talking about earthquakes or volcanoes. Those are geologic events. We're talking about meteorological events, such as droughts, floods, hurricane strikes, uh, heat waves, and stuff like that. So those are the most dangerous issues in the world. Okay? Right up there alongside with that are natural disasters, uh, and that possibly could include some of the geologic issues that I mentioned, but also failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation is a major concern, and then to a lesser degree the economic or the environmental collapse and so on. The other s red square that's in there just below the third diamond is water crises, and that's rep represented as an environment, or as, excuse me, as a uh, financial issue, but that could also be related to uh, environmental in impacts such as droughts, heat waves, and stuff like that. Now this is a map that's, excuse me, this is a, a graph that uh, shows that we are seeing an increase of these issues as the world warms from uh, man-created pollution. Uh, the red line at the bottom of the graph there represents the geologic natural disasters, but the green uh, gr um, lines that you see in the graph there represent uh, the number of storms that are increasing, the floods and landslides from uh, heavy rains. Uh, throughout the, the world, as well as in the very top uh, parts of green there, the number of droughts and heat waves and forest fires that are occurring. And we've seen a lot of these same kind of instances occurring here in the United States, whether it be the middle, the, the floods in the parts of the Midwest just recently from that super cyclone or super storm that they had there that uh, moved uh, from the, the north, northern part of the central part of the country down into the Midwest, or it could be the forest fires that we've seen around Los Angeles and California and a number of issues like that, okay? 
The DOD, the United States Department of Defense, in its uh, uh, climate report of 2014, refers to climate change as a, quote unquote, catalyst for conflict. And that's part of what Cecilia and I have been investigating most recently is exactly what that means and how that manifests itself in Latin America and the Caribbean. Another term they use is, and we like this one quite a bit as well, is an accelerant of instability which means that there are problems, insecurity, instability issues, but the effects of, tr of climate change will heighten those and make them even more severe than they normally would be. Okay? So the rest of the presentation, and really the focus of the presentation today is to talk about exactly what is a catalyst for conflict and what that represents. And uh, uh, it might be obvious to those of you who have followed this very closely, or from the descriptions that the DOD has uh, already provided, that if we have um, areas that are very vulnerable to uh, potable water reduction or d diminishing uh, resources for potable water and agriculture, those are only going to get worse as we go forward. Just yesterday, there was a UN report about the drought in Central America. It's been going on now for a better part of 10 years, and I was just in the region about two weeks ago, and areas that I had seen in the past that were green and lush are now brown, and it's been that way for a long time. Lots of news about the political crisis with, regarding uh, migrants moving toward our southern border through part from the Northern Triangle in Central America and through Mexico. A lot of that, and it's tough to put a finger on exactly how much of that, but a lot of that is probably exacerbated by climate change and the, 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 the coffee crop that's being reduced in parts of El Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua and elsewhere, all instigating this situation that's, even, that's already bad and about to get worse. Now, specifically, uh, examples that we found as we tried to um, tie the theories that we're developing at the Perry Center to actual events, and we've seen um, quite a few examples in the recent history about, about these. And just a few of them on the screen there, uh, divide, we've divided them in both into Central and South America as well as the Caribbean because they are two different regions that are having, uh, seeing different consequences from climate change, okay? Certainly in Central and South America, the, uh, the droughts and the heat wave that have been going on in different, different places or the reduction of um, potable water coming out of the glaciers in the Andes or even the aquifers such as the Guarini aquifer that feeds a good part of uh, the, the southern cone. Uh, and even the, um, some of the viruses that are being carried by Z the Zika mosquitoes and stuff like that that really affected countries such as Brazil uh, could get even worse as we go forward. I lived in Chile in 2017, and uh, it's a huge city of about 7 million people out of a total population of about 17 million. And we had some really torrential storms come in off the Pacific during that time, which overwhelmed the capacity of the two main rivers that flow out of the Andes and feeds as a potable water source parts of the city. So the city went dry a couple times during the 11 months that I was living there. And that's quite an impact on a city of 7 million people when you start having to truck water around to the populations before you can get the water uh, systems back online from the heavy storms that they've had in the mountains. Just one example of that. But lots of other examples of uh, potentially reduced water uh, availability in major population centers such as La Paz or Santiago or even some of the hor horrific floods that we saw from the El Nino effects in Lima, Peru and other places like that. In the Caribbean, as I mentioned, it's a little bit different. The Caribbean has its own sort of problems, uh, unrelated to glaciers, perhaps, but they have uh, their own sort of um, issues related to the Atlantic hurricane season. And in 2017, it was an absolutely horrific, hyperactive, as they called it, uh, hurricane season, which decimated a number of countries. In the top uh, right photo there is something, these, the photo taken from Dominica, when uh, Aruba, uh, I'm sorry, not Aruba, um, Antigua, Barbuda, Dominica, about nine of the 18 CARICOM countries were severely impacted by just one hurricane season. We had three major uh, category four or five hurricanes pop up in the space of two weeks, Hurricane Irma, Jose, and Maria, that devastated a number of these islands. It's hard to say if these are climate-induced, uh, if these specific cases were climate change-induced hurricanes, but certainly a lot of the evidence that we're seeing from meteorologists and stuff are that the storms will get bigger and that they'll become more severe and perhaps could even grow in intensity quicker than uh, before. And one of the examples that we use there, the third bullet in my examples, is Hurricane Maria was a tropical storm. This is just about less than two weeks after Irma and Jose did so much damage. Hurricane Maria popped up on the radar 
It was a tropical storm just off the coast between Barbados and Dominica, and in less than 36 hours, it literally exploded from a tropical storm level with winds uh, to that, to in that category to a Category 5 storm. It caught a lot of people by surprise, it did heavy damage to Dominica, and these are the same kind of things we might be seeing here in the United States. A, st a storm come tracking in as a Category 1 or 2, hits the warm waters of the Gulf Stream off the Atlantic coast, and then makes landfall as a Category 4 or 5 on the United States, or any number of other countries that could be affected by this kind of stuff. And a number of other countries throughout the uh, Caribbean that have been impacted by these kind of things. So to wrap it up, Climate change is a catalyst for conflict, which means that it's not directly a cause for conflict, but it, it can be a, uh, a factor that can generate the natural disasters that occur because of climate change, can contribute to these socio and economic problems that already may exist to some degree in, in countries, and it can actually exasperate those quite a bit. For example, droughts, as I mentioned in Central America, can lead to mass migration. Forest fires and flood can lead to internally displaced persons who then perhaps move into cities because they have no other means of uh, generating income. The lack of critical utilities, such as fresh water and potable water in some country, in some cities, could result in a lot of uh, stress on the utilities and the government services in those areas. Urbanization, remember there's quite a bit uh, published about the uh, Syrian civil war and the fact that there was a desertification that occurred outside of Syria for the pre previous 10 years. And all those people moving into the Damascus and other areas actually overwhelmed the abilities of the government to provide for their citizens. We could see the same sort of things occurring there. Excessive heat waves like we saw in parts of Europe and Russia back in 2003 and 2005 led to tens of thousands of deaths just because people aren't accustomed to living under those extreme heat conditions and don't have the air conditioning systems, perhaps as we're accustomed to here in the United States, depleted food sources, and et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is climate change will contribute to these socioeconomic crises. It leads to a loss of state legitimacy when the government can't provide and fix these problems. And then, because one of the, one of the things we study closely at the Perry Center is the fact that there are a lot of weak governments in the region who don't have the capacity, perhaps, to provide for the citizens. This could lead and, and, and exacerbate the insecurity and inst instability that already exists in the area. None of this is unique to Latin America or to the Caribbean. We've got our own challenges here, even right here at uh, Washington, D.C., where rising sea levels and increased uh, numbers of stor storms and stuff could really cause some complications for us in the future. So we're trying to draw attention to the problems that exist in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, but also perhaps apply them here in our own country as well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for that great synopsis on climate change and how it affects security in the Americas. Now I would like to welcome some questions for our first four presenters. So if you have any questions about um, Dr. Chagas, Dr. DeSanta, and Colonel Godinez or um, Professor Patterson, um, please let me know right now and then we can discuss those and then we'll bring up our next presenter. So, so the question was about the new president in Brazil, and I'll welcome both uh, uh, presenters to come up if you'd like. It's a good question. You know, it stopped the development, and uh, you have the same situation the maybe in other countries, um, in Asia, for example. Um, no, you don't stop the development, but you can't, I believe, you, you, you can uh, balance, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, in my, my examples, we, uh, we propose, my team propose the sustainable projects, you know, but we have the problem with the roles and the, the companies and uh, the businessman <laughs> and uh, the in the final of the balance um, the side of my fragile is the 
traditional communities and environmental and the uh, people in vulnerability as the have the more problem you know i don't know uh is the biggest challenge for uh governance <laughs> i'm engineers <laughs> okay another question for you if we could the Brazilian companies that are working on the environmental issues in Brazil, do they have any sort of environmental ethic pro program that where they have to recognize the, the impact it will do upon the environment before they can conduct their development? Yes, Professor Peterson, uh, it's a great question too, because uh, in many moments, oh, it's, in the next week I, I, I talk about this question with my friend in Brazil, and uh, I put uh, one more question for him. Uh, when you uh, sit in the meeting with the businessmen and the companies and the governance, um, uh, many times you're looking for the economy, you know? And the, all the time you're looking for the economy, the uh, just uh, the, the benefits, you're, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but you never looking for the ecology. The economists uh, asking for you, or for engineers, for example, about the economy. But uh, economists, I, I can asking for the one economist about ecology because they don't understand. You, you know yeah. more sense? <laughs> and uh, because this problem, we have uh, questions about sustainable and the big companies and uh, and then on the other hand, you, you spend a lot of money for conservation. And the companies don't dispose for this money. I don't know, but. <laughs> Perhaps we'll take another question. Yes. I have a question for the Colonel. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that the military is much more aware and up to date and concerned about these issues from climate change to addiction, addiction. How can we civilians encourage or empower our militaries to take charge of these problems, both in the U.S. and in Brazil? I find the same thing in Brazil. The Brazilian military is much more concerned about climate change than the current government. So if all of us were looking for the military to take a rational and problem-solving approach, it feels kind of helpless because we don't have partners with the military to empower them to do more instead of our government running us into the ditch. So, um, so the Western approach to the civ mill relationship, I think, is what you're talking to. Um, what we've erased out of our education in the military side of the house is our, our relationship to politics, uh, not just partisanship, which are two different fields, right? Politics is anything that involves people is a political issue uh, because it's necessarily political. It, we are all involved in different aspects and researching different uh, areas. Uh, and I, I think you're right. I think we do gain a certain level of expertise uh, through our experiences. Um, but ultimately, uh, we serve uh, others. And that's what we kind of uh, expressed around the world in, in, and in other countries. Um, I don't think the military man would be very good at political issues, uh, we're, we're more concerned with um, helping inform than we are of uh, the pol politics, uh, pol political side of the house. I know that's not the answer you want to hear, um, but I I prefer that relationship. Uh, Professor, would you have a, a perspective? Yeah, I would say that. Um Well, I, I, so I, I've noticed over the last uh, three or four decades, uh, the military has pulled itself out of sharing our research, even though it's public access with, uh, just like you've said, uh, with beyond our own uh, community of practice. Um, I don't know what's caused that. 
Um, but it's been it's been a phenomena. So Sir. Yeah, with Thank go you, Sean. going back to the question about uh, how the military can uh, request attention on these issues from the, the government officials, perhaps the, the best way to answer the question is to give you an example. Um, a lot of the waterfronts that you see around Washington, D.C., or down in Norfolk, Virginia, where you have a large naval base, or even just a few minutes to the east of us here at the U.S. Naval Academy, are at risk of rising sea levels. So this is perhaps a very appropriate uh, slide to finish with. This is a, uh, a picture of Fort McNair right here in Washington. That's, our, that's the university where, uh, where Ad and I both work. And you can see how risky and how vulnerable that naval insta that military installation is to the rising sea level. Sea level. This is the Anacostia River on the right side of the screen, and the Potomac Channel on the left side of the screen. The the military, the Department of Defense, predicts that in its uh, 2014 uh, climate change adaptation plan, predicts that the sea levels will rise by 2050, 1.5 to 2 feet. We only have freeboard, as you would call it in the Navy, which is the level between the water, surf, the surface of the water and the land uh, on the base here of a couple feet beyond that. A storm rolls through, and it's going to push a huge surge of water over the banks, and all yes. of a sudden, it already has, and Fort McNair, the third oldest Army base in the country, is going to be underwater. So a lot of military officials are calling attention to this. It's not just the active duty personnel, but it's also some of the retired officials who can speak more freely. As Ad mentioned, we, we're not supposed to meddle in politics. We're supposed to be saluting and following those instructions when we get them. But uh, calling attention to these kind of problems and the financial impact it will have upon military installation is one way to get some attention. The Naval Academy uh, over in Annapolis has brought in a number of congressmen from the lo local area, uh, representatives from Maryland, who have sat with at the admiral, the superintendent of the school, and said to examine exactly what level of risk the Naval Academy is under. I think it's not going to exist for more than another 80 years because of all the things we talked about in my, in my presentation. And that by its, itself is generating a lot of attention, a lot of concerns amongst very influential graduates from the Naval Academy about what's going to happen with their very revered and respected institution. They're going to have to shutter the doors of the Naval Academy in Annapolis and relocate it someplace else. That by itself generates a lot of attention on these issues that perhaps that the military officials won't be able to just stand up and talk about. But talking about the closing of these facilities and the cost that's included with it perhaps is a good way to go about it. Thank you, Colonel Godinas and Professor Patterson. Um, and also to um, just point to our event as well to answer your question. So the idea of military and civilian relationships, I do believe that putting on events like this at the Library of Congress is not only important for sharing of knowledge and new research, but it's also important for us to share between civilians and the military that research. And so I am so happy to say that the Library of Congress, you know, took this event seriously and we are recording it. Um, and I also want to point, you know, I'm a civilian as well. Um, and this is my own event. It is not, it was not regulated by the Department of Defense. I had started this even before working with them. Um, but I'm proud to say I do serve as a civilian and I do believe that we need more civilians to serve. Um, in the government in all capacities and especially doing research. So I am doing research myself and I do um, feel that it's a great place to do research, um, especially with a critical focus. So as you saw in today's five panel uh, presenters, everyone had a critical um, focus on this sustainability security in the Americas, but that's what we need right now. This is happening today. This is happening right now. and what we can do in partnership building is so important. Um, so security cooperation, security assistance, the security assistance is more in line with the Department of State, um, but also we can share in that the civilian engagement. Um, other questions? Most acute 
in your presentation, which the human beings are affected uh, potentially by these things. And as in most people Sasha, all the gold mines dump the cyanide into the lake and it, you know, now now this is becoming uh, a, a question for the scientists, but it isn't quite a question for the public yet. <laughs> um, I was just in, in Uruguay and Montevideo where there is a, 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 a right along the coast there is this algae that hasn't been there before that is probably feeding on the, um, the effluvium that is coming out mm -hmm. from corporations into the water and this is it, it, it has become a health concern um, but there doesn't seem to be the, the uh, connection between the um, activism for the uh, environmental issue and the health issue I don't, I don't see that perhaps there's more than Yes, Dr. DeSanta, please come up. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, this something is new. I think it's special for us that we work more on some things related, related with the healthy and also about the nutrition. But in the lab, you start to uh, think about these, like more environmental things, how this can affect the not only the health, but also the next uh, generation. And we start work with like the pesticide exposed and they also for some environmental disaster, like in the house, we start think about the, the is, is lifestyle, like stress and the contaminations. So yes, we start to try figure out and they try combine and they do some research uh, that involve everything. <laughs> Um, other questions? So, yes. Um. Well, also, in your presentation, uh, you make a very astute analysis. I didn't think I did that, but thank you. <laughs> very, raising the point that the heroin, that the epidemic, the epidemic, the opioid epidemic is not a result of the heroin that is in, from Mexico. Um, it's reflective of the pharmaceuticals and the fentanyl. Those industries don't reside within the United States. What opportunities are there for partnership to address those issues abroad or, or defense access? So uh, currently what we, we, we have a couple of different uh, areas that we've established since the 19, uh, 1909 um, Chinese Opioid Accords. I, I've got the phrasing wrong, uh, but the Chinese had this problem first, right? The U.S. didn't drive the issue. Typically, when you read about the history of prohibition, it's it's told from the U.S. perspective. But we only had, I, I tried to explain, we only had 1% of the populace around the world that were addicted to anything at any time. So the Chinese, huge population, even back then, um, addicted to um, heroin, opioid dens, right? They, they uh, the smoking that uh, started by Indians. When um, Columbus came to the United States, um, that was the first time anybody saw smoking from the Western world, right? And so that smoking opioid, opioids didn't really happen until after that contact. Um, but what are the areas? So we have international accords, uh, usually through the WHO, the U, the WHO World Health Organization. Um, we have bilateral arrangements uh, U.S. China, for example, China has 3,800 uh, pharmaceutical grade companies that produce this stuff routinely. Um, we have uh, e-packet arrangements uh, through which USPS gets advanced data, uh, advanced electronic data for directly from China on what this comes in. Um, but you have this new cryptocurrency uh, that's on on the internet, and you could, there are three levels of internet. You have clear net, uh, dark web, and deep web, right? Um, so people work on the dark web, and on the clear web, you can go online right now and order fentanyl, uh, and it is guaranteed to come to you if you pay for it with cr cryptocurrency. Um, and so w we're working in our own agencies to improve these problems, right? 
we're working with other countries to improve the information that we have on the sale of these illicit items. But I don't think that's the problem. The problem is us. We have to figure out in our society why we entertain the use of illicit substances for self-medication. I think that's the big question. It's an American question. In the 1900s, they fought about this problem. Ended up with the Volstead Act, right, and prohibition. That lasted until we got control of our drinking again. Once we got control of drinking again, heroin users were down significantly. Drug use was down significantly. By the time of uh, World War II, there's literally no heroin to be found, none. Um, the, the, the only thing I can tell you is we have to figure out right now, in this 30-year cycle, who are we? I hope that's helpful. Absolutely. They are key players in this effort. Um, I'm sorry, the question was, is the State Department involved in this? There are 32 different agencies around the world from the United States working with every country to ensure that if we solve this problem in China, right, the fentanyl come from China, that it doesn't move to the other medical grade pharmaceutical companies that can produce this stuff. Oh, and by the way, guess who produces some of the greatest engineers in the world right now? in numerous quantities, Mexico. So we've got to worry about that moving there, right? So we're always working on this problem. But what we're not working on and the topic we're not talking about is what the Surgeon General talks about the United States. We are the most depressed we've ever been in the US. We feel alone more than we've ever felt alone. So what, who are we and what are we gonna do about it? I think that's a big question. Thank you. Does that answer your question, sir? Great questions and great discussions. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, I would just like each of our panel um, presenters to just share with us some ideas for the future, like your work for the future. And um, if you could just briefly give us some insight. Um, Dr. Chagas and then Dr. DeSantos, um, Colonel Godinez and Professor Patterson. So, like I said, so I think my next step is special thing here in the United States. So now let me start working like some environment issues and also how these affect the next generation, especially special for father exposure. So yeah, I think this is probably now is my next step. I don't know when I plan to go back to Brazil and stay there and stay uh, in there because how you asked it to us about the governan governance in there is special for my, my area is, I think it's trying to make it harder because you don't have like a lot of investment in there to make you resort in there that we try to get the opportunity that you have here and they try to help people and they make it the best one that you can do. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, and when I, I make my, my PG, uh, this is very boring. I I, I work with mathematics and uh, and uh, I publish uh, articles about this. But and uh, now I looking for uh, one word. Bec I have uh, one question for you, but don't have more time. But <laughs> is this word is ab about vulnerability? You know, and uh, my examples. And uh, for the examples of the Professor Patterson and the, uh, your examples and the, our examples show in this event, uh, show news about the people in vulnerability. In my case, I prefer looking for the people uh, in vulnerability 
when we're talking about environmental, you know, um, maybe in Latin America, because uh, um, I talking before of the event with, with the professor, and the the last weeks I ha I taking I participated uh, with the course with with and together with the six thousand six thousand people around the world in United State in um, United Nation about security environment, you know, and uh, in this course, I make one question for the professors and the United States, Europe, um, what is the link with the consumption and uh, the vulnerability and the security environmental? This question don't have the answer yet. I think this is my line of the thinking. And the next year, and the, we have the Congress in October about this question. Maybe I think it is my my first study. Thank you. Um, Shelley, I really appreciate you asking that question. Uh, to all of us, because I think our problem sets have a, sh a similar uh, approach that we can take to it. So three years ago, when we started, when I four and a half years ago, when I started working on this problem set, um, I discovered that everyone was doing something. And so what that meant was everybody was doing something based on their own perspective, right? The State Department was doing something based on the State Department's perspective. The House was doing something based on the House perspective. The Senate was doing something based on 100 different perspectives. DOD was doing something that was based on a DOD perspective. DEA was doing what DEA does. Um, healthcare was doing what healthcare was doing about the opioid epidemic. Cities were doing what cities were good at doing at the municipal level. States were trying to organize funds to get to states. Everybody was doing something about this problem set when we started wading into it. There was no consensus about what the problem was. No consensus. When we started working with Mexico on this problem, we didn't have a consensus about what the problem looked like. Mexico had an opinion because hey, they found a bunch of meth labs. So they're still producing meth. There's no way they're making fentanyl. Canada had a whole different problem, right? Because that's not Mexican heroin that's going up there. That's not uh, American fentanyl that's getting, getting up there. So we had to build a consensus through the North American Drug Dialogue, um, a summit level, cabinet level uh, discussion. First, build a shared understanding of the problem with the stakeholders, right? We're, we're never going to get big business to understand our problem sets if we don't work with them. So you have to build a shared understanding of what the problem is, and that takes work. That takes consensus, compromise, work. And it's iterative, right? Once you develop a shared understanding, you might be able to develop a shared approach to the problem. That's what I was talking about in 1900, right? They, they I don't know how you pass a, a law against alcohol in the United States. I mean, those guys are drinkers, right? But they did it because it was a problem. It lasted as long as it needed to last. We took control of our drinking again. So shared approach requires a shared understanding. So the way forward in uh, additional research is a great question. Um, I wish I had uh, positive news to end on here on this uh, great uh, panel discussion. Uh, I would say that the climate change issues are perhaps irreversible. There's just not the political will amongst many countries to, to uh, tackle them. It, it would involve a drastic change to our energy systems throughout many countries who just don't have the finances to do that or the political will to do that. So if we can't solve the climate change problems in Latin America or even here at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C., then perhaps we need to think about uh, the mitigation for, as Rubens mentioned, the most vulnerable populations. And Latin America, which is the topic of discussion today, is the region of the world that has the largest uh, levels of inequality of any other region in the world, even more so than Africa. And the people 
that are the most vulnerable then in Latin America are the poor, impoverished, politically excluded, and uh, economically uh, uh, excluded individuals who are going to be vulnerable to these really disastrous storms or forest fires or droughts or heat waves and stuff that come. So we have to think, uh, p perhaps the answer uh, is to think as we go forward about the vulnerable populations that often in include the impoverished populations of these countries. Thank you to all the presenters today for your wonderful research and for sharing with us and uh, hosting this really active discussion. Um, I would also like to thank the Library of Congress and our sponsor, the Hispanic Cultural Society. Uh, I would also like to give a big shout out to Leah Kerwin. Um, Leah has helped us tremendously in so many different ways. So thank you for all your collaboration, your support, everything. And um, I just personally want to thank all the presenters today because I love listening to all your research and I can't wait to read all these articles and see how we can build that community of practice that was already shared here. So thank you all for coming today. <laughs>